There we go. I think we're live. Okay. Hello, this is Mark Wildman of Wildman Athletica. And today is a recovery day for me. Um, I just went to a seminar, a two-day seminar, which was very good and totally worth it. And we're going to talk about that in relation to other seminars and the structure of seminars and learning uh, in the course of this live. Um, I went to SoCal Supermoto, which I've been trying to go to for about seven years. But I was away working on movies, so I never lined up with their schedule. And then COVID happened, and the world kind of fell apart, and nobody really had time to do anything for a while. But let's review our upcoming events calendar. Um, seminars are important. They are a way for you to get better feedback than you could ever get on your own. Uh, upcoming, London, April 27th, 28th. That is a staff club seminar. That was a staff club mace seminar, but Summer Huntington had another obligation, so I will be teaching the entire thing. So it will just be staff and club in order to keep people from having to drag both clubs and, staff and maces to the event. So it is a staff club seminar. The mace is gone so that people don't have to travel with clubs and mace. Uh, the staffs, of course, will be provided because the staffs are very rare and almost nobody has good staffs. Um, the staffs that we're using in Europe are different than the ones we are using at the North America seminars. The North America seminars, we're using the cold steel staffs, which I really like. But we did find some polypropylene staffs that are available in Europe, which are thinner in diameter, but are longer. So this is the cold steel one that we use. They are get to the camera, hexagonal, octagonal, octagonal, the way the old traditional staffs would have been. The ones that we will be using in London are actually round. Um, I, the ones in London are longer. They are full six feet long, but we have a much larger room than we had last year. Much, much, much larger room than we had last year. So we will be able to use it more effectively than we could. I'm caffeinating, guys. So the April seminar uh, in London should be really good. That's going to be a fun one. I always like to come. The people who train in Europe and in London are very entertaining. Uh, there will be a kid there, guy, young person. Everybody's young to me because um, I'm old. Um, who came to the Thailand seminar. He came to the Thailand five day. And he um, also has spent a lot of time at the Shaolin Temple in China. And he didn't know that he was accidentally going to end up at a Shaolin staff seminar because that's not really how we say it. But it is kind of a Shaolin staff seminar, just buried inside of a different structure of training with the same overall outcome. So he will be there to assist, and Travis Lakeman will also be there to assist teaching as well. Travis has now been to, I think, 11 seminars, and at this point, he can pretty much teach. So he will be alternating back and forth with me. Uh, the whole point is for, not, for me to not be the only person who knows this stuff. Travis now knows this stuff as well as I do. He has put in several hundred hours into his staff instruction, and into his heavy club work. He came to Thailand two years in a row. He came to every seminar that I did for two years. Uh, he's also a tattoo artist, and he'll probably give you a tattoo if you beg him. Um, he drags a tattoo gun around with him. He made me give him a tattoo after the Seattle seminar, which I thought was a terrible plan, but happened. Um, so this, the London seminar should be fun. After that, we have July 20th, 21st, Los Angeles. That will be a staff mace club. That structure will be slightly different than previous staff mace club seminars because it will be focused on staff and club, and we will be making the mace part smaller, but we will be making the mace part integrated into the type of cardio programming that you would use for armored combat fighters. So when Summer was teaching the, the mace part, it was part of a uh, steel mace vinyasa section when i'm teaching the mace part it becomes the murder killer section of death cardio um, it is we will be using specialized maces you can bring whatever mace you want but we're going to be using the ones that we have not yet been able to break that were made by badland outfitters they are i don't know where where they go 
Did they get rolled outside into the shop? Maybe they're in the shop. Uh, we built a giant cart to wheel them around on. But we want to release that cardio program because it's super fun, not because anybody's really going to do it, but because it is absolutely savage. But it is based on staff movement. I highly recommend you have come to a staff seminar if you want to do that program. That program is like a twice a week drop in idea for just brutal, savage cardio for fighters, for the most hardcore fighters, for like Lord of the Rings, Apocalypse, End of the World, Walking Dead, uh, Armored Combat kind of stuff. So the July seminar will be fun. It will be slightly new. October 5th, 6th, we have a heavy club clinic that's pure heavy club swinging. That is what you absolutely need to know if you are going to be an instructor. If you're not going to be an instructor, you should also know it because it doesn't matter if you're going to be an instructor or not. I think everybody should be trained to understand how to communicate information because it indicates that they actually understand the information. October 12th, 13th, we have a kettlebell clinic, which is the same thing. Pure kettlebell, two days, purely focused on the hows, the whys to kettlebell. If you are looking to improve your kettlebell technique, that is the one for you. And then November 2nd, 3rd, we will have another staff mace club in LA, which will be similar to the July one, but it will be an evolution where we're going to get more into the armored combat con uh, concepts. Mm. <clears throat> Good. Uh, seminar talk. I talk about seminars a lot because I think that they are an incredible way for people to get a lot in a small period of time. I've been riding motorcycles for, I don't know, 20 years. I grew up on a farm, but we rode three wheelers because it was easier to drag around tools on a three wheeler than on a dirt bike. And it did less damage to the field to have balloon tires. Side note, these are the Badland Outfitters maces that we will be using at the November 2nd and 3rd in the July 20th and 21st seminar. These are actually designed as implement, striking implements and weapons. And then there are, of course, the sexier versions of them. So we are adding weight by changing head shape, and they are becoming more and more exactly like medieval weapons and less and less like stuff made in China. Um, they are all designed. Is the Mordor mace out there, the one with the, the lava on it? Yes. OK, no Mordor mace. Um, <clears throat> What was I talking about? Seminars. Shit, I lost it. Ah, seminars. Seminars are important because you get more in a small period of time than you've ever gotten before. Uh, I just went to a seminar because I will never tell you guys to do something I wouldn't do. I'd never tell you to buy something I wouldn't buy because I don't want to waste anybody's time and or money. So I just went to the California Superbike School for a two-day level one, level two, and I'm going back and two or three weeks, it's either the Vegas or the Willow Springs again for level three, four. I've been riding for 20 years and this is the way I've heard it. This is the way the head instructor there, Kobe, described it. He said, a lot of people have been riding for 20 years, but they have one year of experience 20 times. They don't have 20 years of experience. And I thought that that was an incredibly succinct way to say that a lot of people do things for a long time and never get beyond year one. Um, so I started riding and when I first started riding, I was absolutely terrible. I grew up on a farm. We rode three wheelers cause you can put fencing tools on a three wheeler that you can't really put on a dirt bike. Dirt bikes tear up the ground when it's wet, whereas a three wheeler with balloon tires doesn't hurt it at all. So, uh, when I came to LA, I got into motorcycle riding as a way to get through traffic, which is of course the best way to die in the least amount of time. And I had somebody take me and coach me for an entire year on just strictly how not to die in Los Angeles, because there's very specific rules about the way that you ride a motorcycle in California. And a lot of people don't listen to that and they don't take a class. And I had a friend of mine who actually lost a leg in her first six months riding a motorcycle because the information was not presented to her in a way that which she needed to know it. Um, the way that I first got good at motorcycle riding was by having somebody just say, I will teach you how to not die. And then I still didn't get good until I rode from the border of Mexico to Vancouver and all the way back down. Because you simply needed a large amount of time and effort in a short period of time in order to change the structure of your brain. 
So the guy who taught me to ride took me on this long ride in order to make sure that my brain would evolve in the right way. It was a 10 day trip or something like that. It was terrible. Somehow it rained all the way. We chased a storm and stayed in the center of a storm from basically Santa Barbara all the way up to the Redwoods, which was absolutely terrible, terrifying, terrible, awful, you know, 90 miles per hour in the rain on big sweeping things. Gets really terrifying really quickly. Um, so I rode for a lot of years and then, uh, my friend who's a very well-known stunt guy took me to SoCal Supermoto and my riding instantly skyrocketed. It's a one day seminar class where you ride dirt bikes that are, have street tires on them and you ride on a track, but you ride for 20 minutes. They bring you in, they coach you on one thing. This is how you know it's a pretty good seminar. They coach you on one thing. You talk about it, you explain it, and then you go out and you just work on one thing for 20 minutes. You come back in. They coach you on one more thing. You go out, you work on it for 20 minutes. One thing, 20 minutes. One thing, 20 minutes. And you fill an eight-hour day like that. You end up spending about 20 minutes on the bike, and then everybody needs five minutes to stop panicking and then 20 minutes of class, 20 minutes. So it ends up being about seven sessions in an eight hour day. And my riding changed so much because of that, that I went back to SoCal Supermoto to repeat the exact same class four more times. I set myself a personal goal of going 10 times and I got in five before uh, COVID happened and lockdown in California happened. And then I, but my riding changed so much so much i got so much safer my ability to stay alive skyrocketed everything about you became more calm and being more calm allowed you to see more have wider vision uh very similar thing this is the same thing that we talk about in staff fighting we change one thing at a time we do a staff seminar and the most important thing is only that you put your hands in front of you and don't get hit in the face that is the only goal for the first series of drills and you do that you do that with everybody right they don't need names they don't need japanese names they don't need chinese names of blocks we don't need to have block one two three four five six seven the only thing that matters is not getting hit and then we stop we pause we talk about it how would you not get hit better don't bend your arms and turn away turn your body toward and drive your arms away from you so your skeleton can line up repeat the drill one coaching cue repeat the drill one coaching cue repeat the drill over the time over time in a staff seminar we take people from having never done something unchoreographed offensive or defensive in range or with power before and we can get them to do it very well by changing one thing at a time repeating the drill changing the people you work with so that you average out if there's say 20 people in a class you work with all 10 people on the same drill you get a lot of data because everybody moves differently therefore your brain starts to average out what's uh, starting to happen so good seminars add up uh the super bike school seminar that i just went to same thing they bring you in put you in all your safety gear of course because you people are doing 150 miles per hour um and they have you do one thing the first time you go around it is you're in fourth gear, no brakes at all, work the track, and they put you out there for 20 minutes. Don't touch the brakes, don't do anything, and then they bring you in and they talk about one more thing, and then they change one more thing, and they change one more thing, right? They don't even use brakes at all until day two, which is fantastic because they're working on tricking people into doing throttle control, right? So they bring you in, they talk to you about it, they explain it, they actually explain the physiology behind what's happening in your brain. It's the same terms that we use, they're just different. It's the same concepts we talk about. We talk about fear reactivity, what happens when your brain panics, and then how do we work our way through that through drills and experience. They're doing the exact same thing at Super Break School, which I thought was fantastic. Um, uh, so I'm going to go back for level three and four because I'm waiting on my lap times to show up. So they take and they track your lap times for every lap that you do over the course of the two days. And you'll see a percent improvement over time. And then when you go to level three and four, you'll see a percent improvement and you will literally see how much better you break, how much better you do all these little things. 
I tell people to go to seminars because these great jumps in skill change the way your brain works and it changed everything about you. This is something that people talk about without talking about. Um, in the fitness world, everybody is doing fitness because they don't want to be the person they were. They want to become a better version of themselves. Um, and the question is, the question is, what do you value? I come back to this a lot. So bodybuilders want to be a different person because they want to look different. They think that they will be different by looking different. 100% love it. Um, I talk about it the other way. The goal of fitness is to do things that you've never done before, go places you've never done, meet people, learn, and talk to them. So the point of my fitness programs is that I can go to superbike school and have no physical side effects. Um, everybody else is talking about, oh, my legs are sore, my hand is tired, my neck hurts, all this other stuff. I thought it was actually physically easy uh, much easier than other types of riding because the whole goal is to learn to relax. But you can only relax if you're strong enough to maintain the appropriate amount of tension. So this is something that heavy clubs teaches you. This is something that clubs teaches you. You don't use maximum strength. You use the appropriate amount of strength at the appropriate time in order to create a better movement pattern. So these are differences. Um, I'm actually, there was a guy there who had done Isle of Man. Uh, if you don't know what Isle of Man is, it is the, the craziest motorcycle race to really ever exist. The highest speeds. I think the track is some 30 miles around. I think it takes almost 17 minutes to do one lap, 230 some turns. It is one of the most dangerous, most crazy rides that you could ever do. It's extraordinarily hard to get into. And there was an athlete there and he was like, Hey, I would like you to, you're talking about this. Please write me a program for Isle of Man. So yeah, sure. Why not? That sounds fun. That's a really easy program to write because if you just do the class, you would understand it. Um, caffeinate, <clears throat> getting a little bit of that pure black coffee in there. Um, so seminars are a really good idea. The goal of fitness is to go do things you've never done, is to go to seminars, to be in shape enough that you will survive a seminar with no ill effects. You can focus on it mentally because it's not affecting you physically. <clears throat> and this goes for martial arts. It's really hard to learn martial arts if you are not in shape to learn martial arts club swinging, single arm club swinging, may swinging, make it easy to learn martial arts because the movement patterns and the muscle chains are very much the same. Everything in martial arts is a leg exercise. Everything in motorcycle riding is a leg exercise. In GP, leg. In dirt bike, leg. Equestrian arts, uh, hunter jumper. It's all legs and core structure. In fighting, it's all legs. You have to hold yourself up. Mountain biking, it's all legs. Road cycling, it's all legs. Everything is an endurance activity where you have to use the appropriate amount of force at the appropriate time. And that's why we should train. Uh, we'll just sum it up as that. That's why we should train. The point of training is to do stuff. The point of training is not just to train. It's not to go to the gym. The point of training is to go to a track that you've never been on and ride a motorcycle as fast as you physically can before you lose it, it's to take a dirt bike up the side of a mountain or around an entire state. The goal is to be able to get on a horse and go for a two mile ride at the drop of a hat. It's to be able to sword fight while doing so because all of that stuff is awesome and good stories. I love the gym, it's fun, but there's no great epic story that came from I went to the gym. There's a great epic story that I rode a bicycle from Los Angeles to Colorado and somebody said, hey, my leg is broken, but I want to put a flag on top of that mountain. Would you go do it for me right now? And you go climb a 13, 5,000 foot mountain in your mountain bike gear just to do it and get back down and barely survive. That's a good story. It's a fun story. So let's stop talking about that for now and let's uh, start looking at some comments here and start bringing in some comments. I'm going to continue to talk about seminars forever because my goal is to convince people to go to seminars. It does not have to be my seminar. It could be any seminar. Pick anything. 
Go do all four levels of California Superbike School. Go to Supermoto 10 times. Go to an armored combat event. Go do the Battle of Nations. Go do every 14,000 foot peak. Uh, go do a five day adventure motorcycling school. Go do all of that stuff because that's the point of fitness. The point of programs is to do that stuff. Uh, Dale Childress, huzzah. Gotta love a good huzzah. Um, huzzah is a great joke. KD, KD asked a lot of questions. Hello, KD. Question, for squats and swings, should the knees be pointed out slightly or pointed straight? Two different answers to this question. If you're using a single kettlebell, I point my feet straight ahead. If I use a single club, I point my feet straight ahead because I am talking about doing squats as mimicking a running pattern. Very simply, on a horse, you do not turn your toes out. On a dirt bike, you do not turn your toes out. On Super GP, you do not turn your toes out. Turning your toes out is this weird holdover from the late 1800s when a lot of the strong men were mimicking ballet poses in order to stand really pretty for what they thought it was at the time. Um, turning out in a squat is something people do in various types of powerlifting techniques. You can turn out slightly when you get into something like double kettlebells, depending on the lengths of your levers, but turnout is not required for a normal squat. You do not need to turn out to sit in a chair. People talk about this all the time, and I cannot beat this into people enough, that turnout is a technique for lifting super heavy weights in the gym, but it doesn't really exist in the real world. You do not turn out in fighting. Uh, you turn in in fighting, in horseback riding. The first thing, if you're riding through a forest with your toes turned out, you're going to rip your feet right off. The same thing is true of dirt biking. You should be able to do your squats and your deadlifts and your swings with your feet straight ahead because that is the base human position. Turnout is not natural. People who tell you that are not, not, not doing something naturally. They probably have something in their background that causes them to do that or some type of movement deficiency that causes them to do that. There is no, let's take it a step further. If you take a squat and you take one foot off of the ground, it's called a pistol squat. There is no turnout in a pistol squat. There needs be no turnout in a normal squat. If you're doing powerlifting, that is different. There are different reasons that they do that. For normal people, 99% of the population, your feet should be pointed straight ahead. Thank you for the question, KD. Um, I see no reason to turn out. For me, uh, If I'm, I'm just going to get a heavier single kettlebell and work on pointing my feet straight ahead. KD question, this is probably another squat question. When you say tuck the tailbone, does that mean the lumbar spine and squeeze the glutes? Are we supposed to hold the lumbar spine flexion during squats and swings? Yet again, your spine is supposed to move in a bunch of different ways. The goal is to optimize your spine to the movement pattern. Your spine is literally a series of joints that should rotate. So there is a certain amount of tuck. You should be not putting in a bunch of excessive motion when you're under heavy load. There is a neutral spine position at the top. I encourage everyone to squeeze their glutes at the top because most people don't squeeze their glutes at the top because we sit down all the time. Your glutes are supposed to always be on, pretty much always be on. People sit down and so they you'll hear this, Tim, this term thrown around, in the gym, glute amnesia, right? Certain muscles simply aren't functioning because they're never called upon to function. And you can see this, we're just walking down the street, you'll see people and they have no glute function, right? Uh, ballerinas do this weird thing where because of their sport, they turn and they align their pelvis a certain way and they scoop underneath. So they have a different type of glute. Um, but for everybody who's not a ballerina, yes, yeah, squeeze your glutes at the top. Um, but your spine should move specific rib cage alignment to support your body. Depends on what you do. Um, at the easiest cue is at the top. Squeeze your glutes, drive your rib cage down. That will align your spine the way it's supposed to be. Your spine is supposed to move. Never let anybody tell you your spine isn't supposed to move. The 
Yet again, this is a holdover from gym culture where they're trying to lift a maximum amount of weight. So they're trying to not move their spine in order to create stability. If you're not moving 500 pounds, then there's a lot of other things you can do. Gymnasts move their spine in every direction. Circus performers move their spine in every direction. Wrestlers pick up in every type of flexion and rotation. So your body, you should prepare your body to do those things through a series of exercises. I think clubs and kettlebells are the best overall average way to get that done in the least amount of time. And then you can go out and you can specialize. We have a sand, uh, we have a slam ball program. That squat is totally different. That entire program is about squats uh, and picking up weights. And that program is entirely different. It's an entirely different type of movement than you would find in barbell. You, if it, you did a zercher squat, that would be the closest thing to it. But this, the slam ball changes the way your core structure works. The whole point of starting with a lightweight and building up is that your body will naturally adapt to the correct position by running the math. <clears throat> Seminar question. Can you list the seven different types of learning techniques you mentioned that you use? Uh, let me, I'm going to lose all the technical terms on this one because I gave up on the technical terms a long time ago because I stopped saying them because it just makes you sound like a dick when you say all the, the technical learning terms. But you have to be taught. You have to teach uh, one step at a time. That's the most important thing. You can only change one thing at a time. The more dangerous it is, the more important it is to change only one thing at a time. If you're trying to change five things going around a turn at 150 miles per hour, something's going to go wrong because your brain can't operate that fast because you're actually outrunning. The bike is faster than your speed of you. Um, same thing is true of uh, staff fighting and everything else. Y your goal is to give one cue at a time, not seven cues. We don't need to name things. We don't need to do all this other stuff. So what we're doing is isolating things down to uh, saying it, repeating things back over time. As your answers get shorter, it means that you understand the concept better. Uh, hearing, you have to hear it, you have to see it, you have to physically do it, right? You have to repeat it enough times in order for your brain to average something. Uh, I say that if people get 50 hours of staff, then they're permanently changed forever, but every one hour will change them forever. This is something that once again came up at California Superbike School, where they said you need uh, 1,200 hours um, in order to have reach a permanent, super permanent adaptation. So, and I did the math immediately, of course, how many days is that in super bike school? Because they have seven 20 minute sessions on the bike. That's 140 minutes times 10 would be 1400. So you would need 10 total days. Yeah, did I do that right? Yeah, 10 total days in order to, to really hit your, 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 before you probably run out of drastic change. Um, the same thing is true in something like staff training. So we have to use the math. We have to see it. We have to say it. We have to do it. We have to physically try it. You have to try to teach it back to somebody. That is important. A lot of people do things forever, but they never learn to communicate it back, which means they never solidify their understanding as it is. And then they need to physically write it down, communicate it verbally or in graphs. Um, is that all seven? I think that's all seven. Uh, am I missing one? I'm probably missing one. Somebody will tell me if I'm missing one. Um, but those are the important things. You have to do that. Uh, a lot of the things that, that gets left out in almost every seminar is they talk at you. They don't talk to you. Uh, they don't ask you a question and then wait for you to respond and then help you get through the response. Um, nobody who comes to my seminar doesn't answer a question. I refuse. I don't care if you're an instructor or not. You should be when asked a question, be able to formulate a response. Otherwise, why you, I have failed. I have failed if you cannot formulate a response. Um, so I will ask people questions over and over and over again and so that they can respond and get better at the response at, at, for the core concepts. Um, that's absolutely key for learning. That's one of the things that's left out almost everywhere is that it's part of the Socratic method of learning um, is the call and response in the repeated call and response. So I, anybody who comes to my seminar, the goal is to get people to give the core response. Every person should give the core response at least seven times for each core idea. 
Uh, the more people there is, the harder that is, so it becomes random, but I focus very hard on that. And even if you're not going to be an instructor, you will teach at least seven times over the course of a two day seminar for like a pure heavy club clinic, kettlebell clinic, or a pure staff clinic. Um, the combination ones are more of a, don't have that be simply there's too much information in order to get that core concept all the way in. So we only get maybe half the number of responses uh, that we would like over time. Um, but that is absolutely key. Nobody should leave a seminar without being able to clearly articulate every key point of the seminar. Uh, and ask anybody who comes to my seminars, you can, they can clearly articulate it. And then they keep coming back and then their, their answers get shorter, their responses get better, and they understand the core concept better and better. Um, one of the things I really liked about SoCal Supermoto, it was a really good seminar, so I'm going to keep talking about it. They talked a lot about vision and how the eye focuses uh, because as you're moving at such a rapid speed, your eye, the way your eye moves is what separates uh, a really good rider from a bad rider. This is something that I did not know, that you know implicitly from fighting where you get a wide view and you learn in the beginning, you look directly at the threat and then you learn to stop the threat. And over time, you stop looking at the threat and you start looking at the joints uh, making the threat. And then you start looking at the body making the threat and your brain learns to predict ahead of time. Um, also, your vision is actually not in real time. It's behind real time because of the way your brain processes data. So the way that we do staff seminars and the way that they do super GP, it's the same thing. You're learning to um, predict things in the future uh, and create responses ahead of time. It's fascinating stuff. It's all, they're not calling it that, but it is observe, orient, decide, act, the same phrases that we use in our seminars in order to talk about um, training people to have the best response in the least period of time. Uh, can you give some good stretches or exercises for knee pain while running? This is a question from Michael Bors. Uh, stretches and exercises for knee pain, your absolutely most important ones you need are your hamstring stretch, at least three minutes. Standing forward fold is what most people will be able to do. Most people will probably not get beyond standing forward fold over the course of their training. I'm going to stand up. My legs are getting tired after Supermoto. Just from the seated position, the hard part is really you have to get in a car and drive back at the end of the day, which sucks. Um, so standing forward fold, your absolutely most important one. Uh, single leg hip flexor stretch on each side. It is the hard part is holding it for three minutes. Uh, usually people have knee pain. So the first thing that we want to do is we work on the back of the leg, right? Hamstrings, everybody's hamstrings suck who live in the modern world, unless you do three minutes of stretching every day for several years. Uh, then hip flexor stretch. We sit down all the time. Most people's hip flexors are not moving the way that they should. So three minutes on each side. The first minute people get a lot of crack. It gets, takes people time to adapt to the three minute mark. Uh, frog stretch, opening the interiors of the legs. A lot of that will restore the movement around the muscles around the knee. And then you can go to VMO stretches, um, kneeling stretch, uh, laying back. That one's a little bit harder for most people. What is the technical name for that one? I don't remember. We just call it the VMO stretch. Um, uh, and of course, uh, calf, single calf against the wall, uh, calf up against the wall, leaning forward, once again, three minutes on each side. Mostly when people have knee pain, it's because the muscles around the leg are not doing their full job. They are not moving the way that they should, so the knee is being pulled into a different type of position than it should be because of what you might call tightness. So everybody will argue about the, how these terms are, but we always use the simple terms. If the muscles around the knee aren't doing their job because they're not moving properly, we call it too tight. And so our goal is to train it to move, train it to fire with a bunch of different exercises, kettlebell swings, um, cross body swings, walking swings, all these other things where we're working on fire pattern, uh, muscle firing patterns. And then we go to restoring length for lack of a better term, around the muscles, around the knee, and then we can go work on specific drills for the knee. The main thing is restoring the movement of everything around in order to allow the knee to go back to doing its job. 
I've had a lot of knee injuries, very severe ones. This is the strategy that I use to be able to walk. And if you start seeing me limp in videos, it's because I have been traveling and cut out the cool down portion, which I always pay for. And then I realize I'm doing it in the, in the sake of saving time. And then I go back to doing it and then I stop limping. Uh, Jason Heath question when rebuilding an adjustable kettlebell, should one add the weight at the top closest to the handle at the bottom farthest from the handle or split between, I just add it all at the top. People say that they want to add it in the middle and I just don't think that they kettlebell enough. Um, just add it at the top. The slight change in balance is not a big deal to me. And I've been kettlebelling for 15 years. The difference between a perfectly centered weight and a weight that's a little bit high is not a big deal to me in any way. Um, if you are a competition guy and you're doing a 10 minute set, that difference might matter to you. But at that point, you're probably using uh, just fixed weight kettlebells. The whole point of the competition adjustable kettlebell the whole point of the competition adjustable, can you go close that door, Ralph? Seeing as how these guys have decided to make as much noise as possible right now. Um, the whole point of the competition adjustable kettlebell is it's a compromise. It is about a 99% perfect product, 99%. Um, it's the right size, it's the right shape. You can get 41 weights if you get the wild man version, which saves you at least $8,000. And that little bit of adjustment in there, you can do it if you want. We've had some guys building uh, 3D spacers in order to perfectly balance it. If you're an engineer and you want to do that, I highly recommend you do that. If anybody has spacers that they've designed for that or a recommendation for that, I'd love to see it as well. Um, that would be a great product for the people who are hyper nerdy when it comes to this stuff. Uh, no, 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 for the kettlebells. A spacer to balance the weight in the middle. Sorry, I'm talking to my guy off camera. Um, other guys have just done it with uh, PVC pipe where they just cut a length of PVC pipe and they label it in order to get it right in the middle. Um, the PVC pipe just requires a piece of PVC pipe that goes around that, is that one inch in the center? It's one inch in the center. Uh, so one inch internal diameter and then they just chop it with a hacksaw and then they just label them. You know, this one is for 12, this one is for 14, this one is for 16, et cetera. Um, I just don't care to do that, um, mostly because I'm probably, I don't care anymore <laughs> about that. Uh, if I, I like my, my center of mass to change just a little bit, the same way I like my center of mass to change with my clubs. Um, I like, like with my ADEX, I put spacers in it to get the weight as far away from the handle as possible because I want the constant length. Um, with kettlebells, the, the center of mass doesn't change that much. The center of momentum doesn't change that much at all. Um, I would love to see some actual test numbers if anybody works at a university and has access to like, uh, you know, force production um, computer graphing software. I think that would be really cool. Um, but I've never seen anybody do that. But I think the percent change would be low enough that it would be nearly inconsequential to 99% of the population. It may matter to competition guys, but um, I, I can't, I just don't, I can't think of why it would matter for me personally. Question, Corey Bantic Fire, Bantic, Corey Bantic Fire, people have great names. Intro kettlebell, getting my low, getting low back pain. I think my core just isn't strong enough. Should I regress weight or add additional exercises? Eight kilograms triggers the pain. Go down and wait. So uh, this is back pain is directly usually related for 99% of people in the beginning to not getting core firing and specifically glute squeeze, glute squeeze. So uh, depending on your size. So the whole intro to kettlebell program is there's five exercises uh, per level, five levels, and we build up and you'll notice there's a bunch of deadlift exercises. And you'll notice the key thing that we want you to do at the top is to straighten your leg and squeeze your glutes. This is not easy for people in the beginning. 
you actually have to have reps. This is math. You have to have a thousand opportunities in order to try to do it. You go up in weight. If something hurts, you go down in weight and you start the program again and you run it again. And the goal is to build up over time. We would like to add single arm club swinging into that program eventually because going straight up and down, if we're not getting our core firing and our glute firing properly just doing that, then we need to go to a single arm club program. Uh, there's a version of it, the heavy club section in TOI, inside circle, outside circle, shield cast. As people rotate around the center, they're changing the position of their core. They're learning to lengthen and contract muscles on both sides of their spine. And as the weight swings across the bottom, they'll try, their glutes will try to fire on both sides. Cut, the combination of kettlebell and club is meant to fix problems with the other one forever. So you, it depends. The goal is to alternate programs between a kettlebell program and a club program and then run it through and then go up and wait on one. It'll try to drag muscles on by changing the movement pattern and then going back to the other. Uh, they complement each other. One is a rest for the other one. They alternate back and forth. So if you're getting back pain at 8K, the goal is to go back down and wait. That's why we designed this new kettlebell, the Mark II from Bells of Steel, which is much smaller than the other one. This is a 6 to 12K. This one is specifically designed for ITK. And then we're going to try to get it all the way down and we're going to get half K increments with this one as well so that we can do six, six and a half, seven, seven and a half so that we can repeat the program to get more data, more opportunities to learn, more reps, more time. And then we can combine this with the ADEX, which goes all the way down to four and a half pounds so that we can build out forever. We're trying to make it mathematically impossible for people to fail. Um, but if you are having back pain, straighten the legs, pull the kneecaps up, squeeze the glutes. If you cannot figure out how to do that, that's fine. That's why we have other programs. You can jump programs. You can change the weight. Those are always the two options. Change the complexity, change the weight. If you have pain, go down in weight or jump programs to something that moves at a 90 degree axis. So I think kettlebells go this way, I think clubs go this way. I think that's a 90 degree change in load. And then run a program and rebuild. Excellent, excellent question. These are the questions that we always should be answering because these are the ones that discourage people. They have pain. What do you do? Go down and wait, start again, and maybe change programs by 90 degrees and repeat this over and over and over again. Your goal is to get a lot of experience, but we're not trying to get our year one experience 20 times. We're trying to repeat different programs and stack up. As we go up in weight, you will have to figure something else out. Uh, question for TOI, training for overweight and deconditioned individuals, which now has three sections, a kettlebell section combined with a bat for rotation, a heavy club section, and an Indian club section. For TOI, what Indian clubs should we use? What shape and handle type? Uh, I'm going to send Ralph over here to grab these ones that I got off of Amazon. There will be better solutions in the future, but this solution is so cheap that we can't avoid it. These are a club from a company called Logest, L-O-G-E-S-T. They come on Amazon. The program can be repeated with as many clubs as you can get. A one pound pair is something like $20. A, 20, a two pound pair is something like $25. You can get a one pound, two pound, and three pound pair. These are the threes. I just use these today because I would never tell you to do something I wouldn't do. So I'm running the exact same program that a lot of TOI people are using. And then we are... Great Lakes Gear has offered to make us some other slightly different weights. Um, these are metal. They're slight. They're going to be more expensive, but they will outlast civilization. But I am working on creating all of these products in order to stack up with these things. 
Those are the Great Lake Jira ones. There should be more of those and more weights coming out soon. Um, so yeah, let me low jest. L O G E S T. I don't know if you guys can see that. Low jest. So those are the Amazon ones. Uh, this is the size and shape uh, that most, this is the common Indian club shape. Kind of soft on the edges so that if you scrape your head, it's not quite as hard. More mass in the top. These are mimics of wooden clubs. The problem is wooden clubs tend to be very expensive. They're very expensive. You're looking at like $140 a pair. So the goal is $20 versus $140 we're trying to use the least expensive stuff for now. And if you want fancy stuff, you can get it later. Um, the great thing about Indian club swinging is once again, it's infinite. In the TOI program, we would like you to start with the affordable thing so that you will do the program. If you can get uh, one pound, two pound and three pound pairs for 50 bucks, that will be, we're gonna, we're gonna stack up three years of training for that $50 product that is on our list right now. We are shooting <clears throat> five more of the double club add-ons uh, that are gonna go into TOI. So currently a TOI has single club stuff. Think about that as using a one pound club. It was written for my mom and for a bunch of other people's moms that I know. One hand holding one club and learning to do these basic movements of opening the shoulder it starts at four minutes for week one. They're all different. And then week two, it's six minutes and with eight minutes, it builds up to 20 minutes. The goal is to get people to stand up for 20 minutes and not stop moving. And the side effect is they are doing shoulder therapy, neck therapy, and core therapy. And then after they get to the 20 minute timeline, four, four minutes, six minutes, eight minutes, 10 minutes, 12 minutes, 14 minutes, 16 minutes, 18 minutes, 20 minutes, after nine weeks, there will be then 10 additional weeks where we will be adding one minute of double club stuff. So they do all of their single club stuff, which keeps their warm up and their brain going. And then we start adding a double club thing, which is twice as complex, but it's all based on the same movements. Start with a one pound low jest club from Amazon. Uh, who man question, who man a, this is a great question. Mace and jogging together to be fit and strong. Yes, absolutely love this idea. I'm going to talk about this in three ways because I did this idea years ago. Um, idea one, do mace for X amount of time, then go running. Probably the most common way to do it. And then mace while running. A lot harder for most people to do, but very, very fun. So um, I was doing this. I was working with an actor for a film, and we needed to fill an hour of movement and training every day. It had to be different every day. So mace for different amounts of time, followed by treadmill sprinting drills. It was fantastic, fantastic program. We called it the Tom Cruise. It was not for Tom Cruise. It was just on Tom Cruise's treadmill. Uh, <clears throat> working on our basics of mace and mace flow. So adding one step at a time for X amount of time, varying the weight of the mace each day, a 10, a 15, a 20, and then chasing that with uh, its own alternating running program. Absolutely fantastic running program. With a light mace, we ended up running with a mace. With a medium mace, we ended up running with a med ball. With a heavy mace, we ended up running with nothing. So you'll see that that went light medium heavy heavy medium light and they ran opposite each other yes this is an excellent way to do it uh may swinging all of the movements that make you human go to the british museum i say this all the time go to the rosetta stone turn left go into the ancient assyrian stone carvings there's maces all over in there carved into the walls from four thousand years ago ancient assyrian I'm getting somewhere. I'm, I'm my time frame's a little off, but you'll notice the big guy with the long handled mace is always the king, and the warriors have a shorter handle mace, but it's all maces. Mace and run is one of the most basic human things you can do. 
So building your fitness on top of that, I think is a absolutely fantastic idea. And then building it into mace cardio, which is unchoreographed fight drills based on staff fighting is an idea even one above that. <clears throat> YouTube punk question. What routines besides workouts should be done daily? Example, neck mobility routine, swing a club for 10 minutes. Seems like a handful of exercises you think should be done daily. So I have a bunch of stuff that I would like to do daily and I tend to alternate them. I like to mace daily. So I have a big mace probably over there, which is my four minute wake up mace where I do four to 10 minutes of mace as soon as I wake up. Some days I pick up a club, an ADEX, and I do 20 minutes nonstop with 20 pounds. Uh, but my, 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 my single arm weight average, kind of my comfortable weight is 35. So that's something that's very light. Um, I think you should probably neti pot every day. Um, I've had a ton of sinus issues over the years from being hit in the head fighting uh, i got cracked in the face in 2017 on a movie set with an axe and i broke a tooth and we were in like two feet deep of mud this huge battle scene hundreds of guys and you're rolling around and you get that stuff in your mouth and i just didn't know what a broken tooth felt like so i just ignored it and i got a giant infection in this whole side of my head and i look like the elephant man um, and I had to go on antibiotics for 60 days. And my sinuses on this side have never been the same since then. So I do my breathing in the morning, which is some type of movement like mace or club. And now I've been integrating, like today, I did 20 minutes of double Indian club nonstop to work on my breathing. Then I go neti pot. Then I go into my workout. Um, so I think you should do some type of weight swinging every day because uh, there's no way out of it. Uh, before I knew about this stuff, I used to do my Kung Fu forms every day. And if you knew 10 Kung Fu forms, you would pick three of them to do a day and you would do them nonstop through for like 30 minutes. Honestly, that was probably one of the best workouts ever in all of human history. Uh, and if you were to do that with something like a Kwon Do, which would basically be mace, um, that would be absolutely fantastic as well. Um yeah, there's a lot of stuff you should do every day, and it's going to alter over time. But breathing and moving in a human way, you should definitely do. Uh, for me, neti pot helps me breathe better. There's no two ways about it. You know, I'm always working in a shop. I've worked in a shop around sawdust or metal dust my whole life. Um, it, yeah, it was the 80s and the 90s. Nobody, we, we didn't wear masks. Um, we didn't wear safety glasses. You know, we didn't wear any of that stuff. Uh, so I I was told about Neti Pot back in 2015. I was working on a movie. And a uh, world-famous professional dancer was doing it every morning before we were going to set. And I was like, what is that? She's like, you should do this. Professional dancer, she does it every day um, in order to just help them breathe as you're changing environment. So think about you're on a plane, you're on a bus, you're traveling every day. You've got all this stuff and your body's trying to filter it out. Just help it filter it out, run a neti pot each day and just rinse all that stuff out. So it actually helps me quite a bit when I travel internationally because you're on a plane to Thailand for 14 hours and then an eight hour layover and then another six hour flight, you're getting all this stuff in there that's from around the world, different types of pollen and everything, just rinse it out. So I think you should do that every day. Um, I think you should eat like 10 eggs every day. Uh, eggs are cheap. I think you should just eat a shit ton of eggs. Um, I think that's one of the best things you can do for your health is to wake up, work out, do your breathing, neti pot, eat a shit ton of eggs, go for a walk. I think you should do a lot of stuff every day. Um, and it's all stuff that should improve your life. It's all stuff everybody used to do on accident and nobody does anymore, which is probably why the world is falling apart slowly. Pedro Pietra, is kettlebell better than gym for longevity and overall shape? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's no question about it. There's no way you could make up that the gym is better for your longevity, uh, except for gym being a communal effort where you physically leave your house. 
being a part of a gym, like I was a part of a CrossFit gym, it's not because I thought CrossFit was extraordinarily well designed. It's because CrossFit was fun and it was community. So I used to do my kettlebells and then coach in the morning. And I went to a CrossFit gym for a lunchbox at noon just to go hang out with people. Um, it's the same reason people go to church, uh, the same reason that they're part of a civic civic organizations. It's because doing stuff with people means that you're more likely to do stuff. Um, kettlebells is the lone guy on the mountain. But kettlebells are all movement, no muscles. So there's no kettlebell chest day. There is kettlebell clean and jerk day, which is movements. So think of the gym as chest day, leg day, ab day, back day. And think of kettlebells as snatch, get up, long cycle, clean and press, inside circle, juggling, movements, not muscles. You, by doing movements, you work your muscles the way that they are supposed to work. And it's infinitely variable. If you, one of the things I like to do is uh, 20 to 30 minutes nonstop, nonstop movement with a kettlebell. Pick it up, don't put it down. I do one minute of one thing on the left and the right. I add a step or I change families and I don't put it down for 20 to 30 minutes. Picking up a 35 pound to 50 pound weight and not putting it down for 30 minutes, breathing and moving and constantly thinking and creating new things is better for your health and longevity than bench press will ever be. People will fight with me about this forever and they say that strength is better than everything. No, movement is better than everything. Uh, movement and breathing together is the secret of uh, every longevity system on the planet. If you look at ancient Chinese medicine, I talk about this a lot. You have the classic three. You have Bagua, Jing Yi, and Tai Chi. They're all movement breathing systems. Yoga is a movement breathing system. Ballet is a movement breathing system. Every martial art in human history is a movement breathing system. Muscles, you need muscles. But training modern muscle bodybuilding is a modern idea. Or you could just train movements heavier. So think about powerlifting as movements. It's a deadlift, it's a squat, it's a press. But it could, you, you need more movements. You can define movements. There are six directions the human body moves in, and you need to do those every day for health and longevity. Heaving, moving up and down, surging, moving forward and back. Heaving, surging, swaying, stepping side to side. Um, uh, yawing, rotating about your central axis, rolling about your central axis, and pitching. You need to have those six movement families every day. Kettlebells do that on accident. Club does that on accident. Mace does that on accident. Indian Club does that on accident. So for longevity, kettlebells will be are better than the gym. If you can do the gym and you combine it with a movement thing, then you have a good strategy. But most people, because it's not baked into gym, will stop doing the movement and keep going to the gym. Um, so Pilates uh, is like Pilates and ballerinas go together, right? And so think of Pilates as gym and ballet as the movement. Um, but if you stop doing Pilates, you should keep doing the other one. The movement thing is the thing that actually is the thing. Uh, longevity, you get old when you lose movement patterns. When you look at somebody who is old, they're rounded forward. They've lost this movement. They've lost the ability to move their spine. They've lost the ability to move their hips. Movement is better than muscles for longevity. For sports, all sports are movements, except for powerlifting. Um, that's about it. Uh, so yes, I can talk about that one all day. Um, let's go down to the bottom here and start at the bottom. Uh, we can never get everybody's question every time, but we try to bounce around here. John from NYC, Mace flow question. Out of the 100 or so Mace videos you have made, can you suggest a flow sequence using the numbers of your Mace videos so I can put together a Mace flow? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember what all 100 of the Mace videos are, guys. Uh, I made those in a logical series, um, and those are stepping stones. So the point of the Mace videos was 
uh, when people teach mace flow, they teach it as a mace flow. They teach it like a dance class. The reason nobody goes to dance class except dancers, dropping my staff, is that uh, dancers are super annoying because they talk in eight counts. Um, and they go, da, 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 and they do their eight, and then they add another eight, and they give you three eights, which is 32 movements, and they go, go. Um, and there's a reason you don't learn dance for the most part after a certain age. It's because without learning the vocabulary and all those things first, people tend to fail. They don't, they don't learn. They don't get it. And dancers don't care if you learn because most of them are dicks. Um, ask me how I know. I've dealt with dancers my whole life. If you can't do what they do within one round, they hate you. That comes from the dance auditioning process. They have to get rid of people. They're not trying to include people. They're trying to get people out. They're trying to make people go away. Um, the whole point of my MACE series was I started at the beginning and said, I think that this is important and I don't see people understanding it. And I said, what if I just taught one thing a day, an inside circle, an outside circle, an inside circle catch, an outside circle catch. The whole point was that you could start and do video one and do it on day one. And then you day two, you could do day one, day two, day one, day two, day three, day one, day two, day three, day four. And at some point you stopped doing one and you started doing the previous three and you worked your way up. The goal was it was trying to trick people into learning the basics so that they could actually learn mace flow because mace flow tends to be a step in a direction and an arm movement at the same time. Um, which tends to be a lot more than most people can handle. Uh, mace flow, martial artists and stuff tend to really like it. A lot. Some people learn it very, very well because they just do nothing else. They spend an hour on it every day and they get good at it over time. Um, but if you want to make your mace flow, I highly recommend you make your own. Pick a step of direction, pick an arm movement, set a timer and work on it for 20 minutes. Do not put the weight down. Work on it. Do one thing for one minute, figure it out back and forth. Do it on the other side. Do both sides of everything because it will analyze and then figure out how to add one step. So you can make your own mace flows and you should be making your own mace flows every day, forever. Um, so will I suggest one? Um, I could eventually. I was going to write a mace program, uh, but it was all going to be based on actual martial arts instead of dance currently mace flow is basically dance um but I, I wanted to turn it back into martial arts um so there's a lot of it's 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 ballet for 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 muscly guys um which is cool i love it don't get me wrong i'm a, i do circus right this thing right here is a circus silk i got no problem doing pretty shit uh but it is a creative process. And the point is for you to do the creative process. Do a bunch of the basic things. Pick, pick up five numbers from the one to 100. And then do each one for a minute. And then do movement A, movement B, combine them together. And then do movement B, movement A, combine them together. I just pick three. Pick three moves out of the 100 and do it every day. So... Do each move, do A for a minute, do B for a minute, do C for a minute, do A, B for a minute, left and right, do B, A for a minute, do B, C for a minute, do C, B for a minute, do C, A, do A, C, do A, B, C, do C, B, A, do A, C, B, do C, A, B. There, 20 minutes, done. There's your maze flow, bud. Problem solved, problem staying solved. Uh, I'm sure everybody got that. <laughs> If you watch enough programming videos, you got that. Uh, Jesse John's question. Is it possible to buy the Indian Club program without having the TOI subscription? Not right now. Would you like that, Ralph? It's, okay, here's, here's the funny thing about... Here's the funny thing about the TOI program. Um, at one, two, and three pounds, it's uh, mobility. Uh, when you do it with an ADEX, it's actually a shoulder cap program, um, which uh, we were going to talk about. We were going to make a video about it. We just kind of forgot about it. Um, so think about a light ADEX 
the wild man handle is four and a half pounds plus spiral plus spindle is six and so think about doing one minute of some isolation drill like this with a six pound club and then walking it up with the 1.25 if you get to 10 with that it actually turns into an extraordinarily savage shoulder cap program on accident so how much how hard would it be for us to make that It's on the list. It's on the list. Um, what is on our list right now? We got a finished single arm club, the the big one, because my editor hated when I shot it, so I had to redo it. So he would actually work on it. Then we have to do we have to do the Indian club, the double club, double Indian club. We have to do that edition. What after that? It's on our list. TOI stuff. That might not be hard to do. We gotta do the mace, mace cardio program. I wanna write the super GP program for the Isla Man guy. The ab program, the ab program. This is the one that we're bumping way up in priority. Um, so I'm actually gonna have somebody else probably model this one. I'm gonna have somebody else model this one because we just don't have time to do all this stuff. So this is, this is awesome. This is going to be uh, a pure movie abs program. This is an, an add-on to other programs. So like it would be like you would do your kettlebells and your clubs and then you would do like a movie abs section. It has 250 videos in it, which of course, because I'm insane, uh, because what I want is um, 50 weeks times five days a week, no exercise, no workout is the same. So it has families of movements. Um, so that is the one that we're actually supposed to be working on this week. I just can't think right now because I've run out of decision capacity after a supermoto class, um, super GP class, not supermoto class, super GP class. Can't remember. Uh, that's the one that we need to work on the most. Single arm club, movie abs. We have to edit the four body weight programs. The T we'll get it done. I have to start editing a lot more. So yes, maybe we can make that a part of a separate program and we will it's written on the board now <clears throat> uh here's a question from zoos uh they have the wild man club kit and they're following along with the mill squat program which is now the bjj uh order in progress uh first program or similar to it with some modifications is finishing level three at 15 pounds. Repeat with one arm or a two hand weight, two hand, go up in weight with two hands. Your goal is your basic two hand club with 50 pounds, 15 pounds, 20 pounds, 25, 30, 35, 45, 50, all the way up eight weights, at least three levels times eight weights, 24 times through that could be at least 24 months easily to get you up there. But yes, the goal of the two-handed club program is to go up in weight. Um, every time you go up in weight, you will have to stabilize harder. Your core will fire harder. You will have to stand up more. You'll keep your feet on the ground more. The goal is to get good at two-handed club. Think white belt, 15 pounds, 20 pounds. Blue belt, 25, 30. Think brown belt, 50 pounds. Above 50 pounds, uh, you're into the black belt range. Uh, Randall Davis, Red Force Chinese Boxing. We're always talking about Kung Fu. Uh, wants me to do a Marshall Mace program. I'm trying, buddy. I just have to have time. You got to show up here at the warehouse and help me do it. Somebody's got to help me do the Marshall Mace program. Because um, we can concept it all out in one day and rough it out in one day with our new fancy schmancy editing uh, thing. And it's really, we're just adapting um, previs for movies, the way that you shoot action scenes uh for movies we're pre visiting creating it aligning it and then sending it out to people to try before we do the final shots and then we bring it back in and we do the finals um so somebody show up here who knows a shit ton about kung fu and help me uh amina the warrior red force chinese boxing somebody um i used to have a friend um she was on wonder woman with me what's her name uh, who did Kwando, she'd be perfect for it. Uh, somebody who knows Kwando, because we need to turn Marshall Mace back into 
We need to turn mace flow back into martial mace, martial mace flow. But it has to have a purpose. I refuse to do anything that doesn't have a purpose because I'm too old. Uh, SKC 1983. How did I, Mark Wildman, get into this genre of strength and conditioning? 100% Kung Fu and working on a farm. 100% Kung Fu working on a farm. Um, you work on a farm. You spend a lot of time picking up bales of hay. You spend no time in the gym. Um, you spend a lot of time watching Kung Fu movies in the 80s, and you see all the stuff that they're doing in a field, not in a gym, in a field. Uh, Kung Fu training sequences always happen, picking up rocks, doing all these weird things, picking up rocks and throwing them, standing on top of a beam, on top of a barn, um, all of that stuff. So I was always trying to learn Kung Fu, and I went to – I left Ohio, and I came to – LA, I would try to go to a bunch of places and they all sucked. I met a guy at a library uh, and he just walked up and said, you do Kung Fu. Because Kung Fu guys can pick each other out of crowds the same way that ballerinas can pick each other out of crowds, the same way circus performers can pick each other out of crowds. And he just goes, you're going to come to my Kung Fu school. And that was Master Choice Kung Fu on 3rd Street underneath the Buddhist temple. And I went for seven years and they did all kinds of traditional weird strength training and things like that. Um, and then I found kettlebells and heavy club swinging while researching Kung Fu stuff. So think of heavy club swinging as the, the super science version of Chinese golden melon hammer. And think of Russian kettlebell training as the better version of Shaolin stone padlock with just more weights available, more consistent things and math applied to it. Take away the tradition and the four word poem in Chinese that denotes each movement and turn it back into something between um, Kung Fu and between strength training and then super science the shit out of it. Um, so that's how I got into it. It was Kung Fu movies, Jackie Chan movies in particular. Uh, same reason you get into parkour, you want to do Jackie Chan shit. Um, well, part of the thing with, uh, I don't know if I've ever talked about this, of all the seminars I've gone to in my life is because I'm still trying to do Jackie Chan shit, Batman shit, and James Bond shit. Uh, because when I was a kid, I lived in the middle of nowhere and I was super poor. And we had like one radio station and two TV stations. We had NBC and Channel 44, the Christian program programming station, where we only had black and white reruns from the 1950s. And then somewhere along the line, I started... Uh, we got like TBS or something and they had un old Kung Fu movies on it. And I met some guys and they had like VHS, like Jackie Chan movies. And so I came up with a list of shit that they were doing in these movies. And I said, why don't we learn to do all of these things? And I set about trying to find a way to learn these things with no information, pre-internet, because that's how old I am, pre-cell phone. And so like the way that you did it is you actually just got on a plane and you or actually got in a truck and drove to Los Angeles and moved here to look for Kung Fu. I literally came here to look for Kung Fu and ended up as a chemical engineer because um, you had to do something. But there's a big list of stuff that you need to be able to do, right? The, the easiest ones are learning martial arts, but you have to find somebody who's actually going to teach you martial arts. Most people are not actually teaching martial arts. You have to learn sword fighting. Most people are not actually teaching sword fighting. They're teaching choreography. Very different things. Um, anything with a pattern is choreography. Anything OODA loop is actual decision response stuff. Super rare. Super hard to find. Um, you need to learn motorcycles because motorcycles are badass shit and they show up in movies and shit all the time. You have to learn firearms for real. Not just redneck firearms. Firearms, firearms. You have to learn all of that stuff. You have to learn transitions. You have to learn cars. you got to learn to ballroom dance. You've got to learn to do a bunch of these things that you see in all of these great ideas. And you should keep trying to learn them forever. You're never done. And you should keep doing them forever. You're never, ever, ever done. Kung Fu just means hard work. And you're never done with the hard work. Ever. You just keep going. And I will keep making programs and finding ways to be better at things because nobody wrote programs that actually made me better at anything. I had to do it myself as a combination of chemical engineering and available weights. So I had to take into, into account economics, how much time does it take, how much space does it take? You know, there's no, there's no uh, hall of wooden dummies that we can go to and train at every day. You have to figure out how to do these things for yourself. 
you have to go learn how to move around your environment um, and try to accomplish things, not exactly as they did it, although that's not a bad idea, but you have to accomplish the idea of what they did. Uh, Thomas Kumpf, do you recommend kettlebell and mace training if you are overweight with an arthritic hip, atrophied leg glute? He has rotation on his bad side. Absolutely. The reason people have a weak leg is because they're standing in their strong leg. In order to get people to balance and put more weight in their bad leg, they swing weights laterally. This is club swinging. This is kettlebell swinging. Kettlebells are better at this than maces. Um, so I know because I had a ripped leg. I didn't walk for six months. My entire leg atrophied up to a tiny little bone. I was in pain every day. And the way that I fixed it was through single arm heavy club swinging, which got me back to kettlebell swinging, which got me back to mace swinging. Uh, there's a reason I say movement's not muscles. Muscles didn't help me recover. Movement helped me recover. Um, you have to learn to go through it. It is awful. It is not easy. Just so you guys know, training doesn't get easier. You just get stronger. Uh, never, I had a client, I was working on a movie with a guy and he was, said, man, training is so hard. And I said, yeah, it is. And he said, oh, is training hard for you? And I said, of course it's hard for me. It's hard every day. It never gets easy. You just get more capable of doing it. That's it. It never goes on autopilot. It is a struggle every day forever. But the question is, do you, are you in pain because you did nothing or are you in pain because you did something. You don't get to, you just pick. You, pain is a constant in life. Uh, four fundamental truths of Buddhism, right? Uh, pain is pain is everywhere. Pain is life, right? Number one. Uh, somebody will tell me if I did that wrong. I'm sure I did. Um, pain is uh, constant. Change, change is undeniable. Change yields pain. Somebody who uh, remembers, their, remembers their four fundamental truths and eightfold path will comment and tell me about that. Um, but pain is a constant. There's no way out of it. If you're alive, there is pain. Um, you have to learn to put up with it. You are either in pain because you are deconditioned or you are in pain from climbing a mountain. The goal is to get rid of, rid of the pain that you have when you wake up, that when you stand up. And you trade that pain for some other type of discomfort. You are trading discomfort for pain. If you are discouraged, you that is something we have to work through. We have to start with a light enough weight and we have to make our goals doable. The Training for Overweight and Deconditioned Individuals program has a section where it is four minutes with this, a one pound weight. And you have to learn to move again. It is four minutes because it, it should be accomplishable even by people who are in severe pain, severely injured. And we build up and up and up. Um, if you train and you go out and you do an hour and you're in, in your deconditioned and then you never want to train again, that has been a failure on program design. Uh, and so we don't want to do that. You, we can always get better forever, forever, forever. We do not have to accept a decline and we do not have to accept pain. And we shouldn't philosophically. We should rage against the dying of the light forever. So we should. So just do it. Uh, it is hard. Frank, hey Frank, question, Judo BJJ. Uh, Frank, uh, Judo BJJ guy in Michigan. He's a coach and I talk to him about Judo and BJJ all the time because he remembers all the phrases. I don't because I've been hitting the head a lot. If time is a factor for training, what should take priority for benefit the grappling arts more? Single arm or two-handed club? Double-sided answer, Frank, and it's alternate back and forth. You're gonna run a two-handed club program until you burn um until you don't want to anymore there will come a point so you track your data you run through your two-handed club program that's going to get your fundamental stuff and you're going to get to a point where you just don't want to do it before judo class anymore jump to single arm club the answer is both i know it's annoying and it's stupid um two-handed club is your global movement pattern which is going to help your main judo and bjj grappling jump to single hand when you get tired of it your life is long you know, Frank, you've been doing BJJ and judo for I don't know, at least 10 years. Um, jump to single arm 
and then run through some programs until you and then go back to your two handed club, pick up somewhere near where you left off. Usually take three workouts to ramp back up, make it a 50% weight, a 60 or a 65% weight and 85% weight and get back to your hundred percent weight over the course of three workouts and keep going. So which one is more important in the beginning? We say two handed club because that is the one that's going to make sure that people rotate equally well each direction. So if they hit double arm lock on both sides with each hand high, then they're getting the thing that's probably wrong with BJJ and judo guys. They're probably tight on one side from always landing on one side because schools really like to throw dominant hand side the most unless they're a really good school and they do an exact equal number back and forth, which they should do. Um, but people will still end up with impact injuries that reduce movement on one side. Um, so two-handed first, when you get tired or at the end of a, at, at the end of two or three cycles, go to single hand, go back, go back and forth. As long as you've been doing judo, that's how long you should do clubs. You should be doing clubs for the rest of your life. So you got plenty of time. The truth of suffering, the truth of the cause of suffering, the truth of the end of suffering, and the truth of the path that leads to the end of suffering. Uh, that's not the way I really uh, heard the original Four Noble Truths. Um, uh, those are the titles of the truths, not the truth themselves, I think. I don't know. I read every I read every Buddhist text in college. I had a, took every um, religions class that there was, I pretty much had. And so we read all of the for all of the fundamental texts of Buddhism all the way through each evolution, the Analects of Confucius, you know, the Bhagavad Gita, all that stuff. Um, but I get them messed up. They get really weird because they kind of turn into a physics at some point with the weird versions of Buddhism and their translation into various types of Zen and things like that. Dharma, the Dharma of a chair is the chair, that kind of thing. <clears throat> Uh, Frank, 15 years judo, 11 years BJJ. Yeah, so now just stack a bunch more clubbing on top of that and you're going to be good. Let's find some more questions. Let's go back here to the midpoint here and see if we can't find one. Um... Does uh, Pedro Pietra, does the kettlebell training translate better for daily life than traditional weight training? Absolutely, 100%. Um, there are common weights that people have moved throughout history, 16 to 32K, uh, 24K is the weight of a bag of grain. Um, all throughout history, that range is the bags of groceries. It's the, it's the range, 24K is the weight of your suitcase. Uh, 32K is the weight of that ultra heavy suitcase that first class passengers get. Um, 16 K is usually, up. Uh, it's smaller than that now, 16. I can't remember what the maximum weight of a carry on is now, but learning to move those weights has been important for all of human history. So you will find those weights showing up all throughout all of human history. Um, and learning to move with those weights is movement that translates better to the real world. I like going to the gym to hang out with my friends, but bench press or clean and press. Barbell bench press, kettlebell clean and press. Kettlebell clean and press is standing, it's moving, it's endurance, it's cross body stabilization, right? Bench press is lying down on your back, which we do anyway, and pressing a weight straight up overhead with no rotation. Kettlebells will always be better than gym training for training people to have a better life. If you wanna climb mountains, it's kettlebells, 100%. If you want to do an endurance motorcycle race, it is definitely kettlebells. Um, endurance weightlifting will always be better than gym training. Bicep curls are very fun and they make people very pretty, but they are in no way better than a, than a heavy club shield cast. A heavy club shield cast will always, 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 no question be better than uh, isolation training, 100%. Uh, 
Uh, all right, guys, uh, this has been going on now for about an hour and a half. Let's try and do just a couple of more here really quick so I can stop droning on. Hot Rod Lincoln, club question. When doing the Bells, the basis of strength program, club question. When doing the basis of strength program, should you run through all of the levels with one weight or run through a level three times with one weight, then go up and weigh three times? So we do not do the second one, no. So there's two paths. You can go through all the levels with one weight. That is usually for people who are injured, right? Or who have some limiting factor. They need a lot more time to adapt to one weight. In the program, there is a giant layout where we start alternating weights and we start alternating levels. Um, Cause you should probably go through at least eight weights in the basis of strength program, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, um, eight weights times seven levels. Eight times seven is 56 <laughs> cycles through, uh, but you'll be really good at something. But eventually it goes, you usually go through level one, level two. Then when you're starting level three, you start alternating with level one with a heavier weight. And you are always running a heavy light cycle as you roll through. So that it is a heavier weight with a simpler path of movement and a lighter weight with a more complex path of movement. At a certain point, you start getting in three weights where you start getting in, say, a 25 for level one, a 20 for level four, and a 15 for level seven. And it should be alternating forever. What you don't do is go through level one and try to crank the weights all the way up because that's a great way to rip your elbows out or to severely damage yourself. There's a giant mathematical layout. It should be in the program. And we talk about this all the time. And you go through probably at least two levels with one weight or more. This changes by person. And then, then they come back and they can start adding in one weight heavier and you need to be alternating. Do not try and go straight up and wait. You will get hurt. You will get hurt. You do not move well enough. Your joints are not adapted enough. Do not do that. That is a terrible plan. That is a great way to get hurt. Um, you should be alternating after a specific period of, of adaptation. Uh Radame, Radame Gal, Ga, La, Raza. I'm saying that wrong. Radame Galarza. Radame Galarza. Can I do the ABC program design even though I am 40 pounds overweight? Yes, the point of the ABC program design is to cycle people through different types of training. The goal is to get people good. An A program runs on its own math. A B program runs on its own math. A C program runs on its own math. The goal is to not overtrain one thing and burn your desire to actually train. The goal of running separate programs with separate goals is they accidentally line up with a heavy light cycle. An A program is running on its own heavy light cycle. A B program is running on its own heavy. But because the programs are different, the math lines up in order to have one thing be rest and one thing be work and to keep the program going and the variation going forever. If you are overweight, the goal is to get you to train more. We do not want to overtrain one thing. We do not want to burn you out on one thing. Constant variance is one of the key techniques in order to make people good at stuff so that they can build good habits so that they can get what they want. An ABC program design should 100% be done by people who are overweight. We have an integrated in the TOI program, the training for overweight and deconditioned individuals. We have, and it's set up as an AB program. You can do the A program, which is all kettlebells. And then there's an AB program, which is kettlebells alternating with heavy club, alternating kettlebell heavy club and going back and forth. That is a trick. So we broke it up into those different things because we don't want to tell people they have to have all the equipment at once. We want to give people options so that they can get in when they have the money to do it to get the equipment they need to move on. You should not be required to have the perfect gear in order to do a program. My job 
is to make a version of the program that could be done with a Walmart kettlebell or a Walmart dumbbell and a baseball bat, and then you run it. And then you come back and you go, I got a kettlebell. And you go, I got a kettlebell and a baseball bat, and I can run it. And they go, I got a kettlebell and an 8X. Now I can run it again and integrate it, right? The goal is to make it as doable as possible. I'm trying to do that. I can always do better, and I will continue to do better because none of these programs are done. They are done for now, and we're editing them as we have time. The goal is to make every one of these programs better forever. I'm trying to create a super science program for absolutely everybody and eventually you'll enter the equipment you have and we're going to get a program for you that lasts for 10 years the goal is to make everything better and we can always design better engineering never ends uh, uh cult of hercules uh, is having trouble moving from 15 kilogram single arm to 20 kilogram single arm. Any advice based on your own experience? Um, he did not say, Cult of Hercules, is that kettlebells or clubs? I am going to assume that it's clubs because you said 15 and not 14 or 16. Uh, kettlebells tend to come in the even numbers, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, etc. Clubs. Yeah, so it is, I was right. 15 kilogram single arm to 20 kilogram single arm. That is a terrible plan. Um, you're not going to make that jump very well at all. Um, this is why the 8X was invented. Um, making a five pound to a 10 pound jump is really hard. I did it, but I have years of training and experience. Um, if you want to make that jump, you should come to seminars and figure out what's wrong with your technique because trying to make that jump without perfect technique is a recipe for disaster. So five kilograms times 2.2 pounds is 11.2 pound jump in weight for a single arm. Your math has to be perfect. Your program has to be absolutely perfect. Um, you should have at least 20,000 reps of other movements before you try to make that jump. You should be running an AB heavy light cycle. Um, your, everything has to be absolutely perfect. I don't know anything about your program, uh, but that is... The odds of you pulling it off randomly are low. Um, I can write you a perfect math program for that because I did make that jump, but it's very, it's not easy. And you really have to have perfect technique. Um, your advice is you have to run the 15 with, you're gonna write, run at least eight cycles with the 15, at least eight with the 15 um, before you jump to the 20. If you have not run eight full cycles with the 15, I would not try to jump to the 20 the odds of you thrashing your elbow are high. Um, if you are micro bending your elbow across the bottom, right? So if your elbow is not perfectly straight across the bottom on the swing, if you're micro bending, you're in super danger. Uh, definitely don't be in super danger. Guys try to do this jump a lot. The whole point of the ADEX was that people could do two and a half pound jumps, which made the survival rate much, much, much higher. Um, but you need to run at least eight cycles with the single arm 15 with at least four levels of complexity. I would actually run that for eight cycles with eight levels of complexity before trying to jump to the single arm. Um, that should be a multi-year strategy. Um, I don't have enough information here to really answer that question, but that question makes me say that you should be running at least eight cycles. Um, and each one of those cycles would be at least five weeks long uh at least five weeks long um at the short end uh let me do the math on that in my head really quick six eight ten twelve fourteen sixteen eighteen twenty five weeks uh six seven six seven eight nine each, each one of those cycles is probably eight weeks long um at the short end um yeah, I don't really have enough information to answer that, but uh, most people aren't going to make that jump super successfully without a lot of training. Um, if you have improper foot placement, if your grip is bad on one side, if your shoulder's not moving well on one side, you're in danger. Um, this is If people are trying to get to that level, which I think it's awesome that you are trying to get to that level, I need a lot more information on what you're currently doing in order to give you a better concept of what to do. Um, 
I don't have any movement patterns in there. I don't have any strategies for moving forward. I don't have how many days a week you're doing it. All the information that you need to give people is not there. Okay, so he's been running 15 kilograms for a year now. So he has done his eight cycles. I'll come train with you and you have the money. Good, right? Um, that That's a big jump, right? 20K is uh, 45 pounds, right? Um, uh, so that, that's big stuff, right? I've done it. I know a couple of guys who've done it, but it's not super common. So Cult of Hercules, you're doing a great job. Um, getting to single arm 50 is massive, uh, and you will have arms of steel. You will be, have monstrous arms for sure. All right, guys, we're going to close this down here. Um, thank you so much for coming in and listening to our ongoing talk about training and all these other things. You do not have to come to my seminars. You just need to go to seminars. Pick things that are super cool and go do them. Go to all the classes, prepare for them. The goal of training is to go and do cool things in life. Um, I just did Super GP. I'm going to go do the rest of the training for that. And I'm probably going to buy a motorcycle to go with it and a set of leathers because uh, it's awesome. Um, you should learn cool things. You should do cool things. And you should be physically prepared to do them at the drop of a hat. That is the point of the way that we design training. The goal is to make you move better, move better longer, make you capable of learning. If you come to our seminars, you will see learning technique laid out before you, and we will talk about it the entire time. I love to talk about learning technique because it is important for you to learn technique for learning so that you can get better whatever you want to get better at. You don't have to get better at the stuff I do. You can get better at anything. But it's all the same principles, and they carry through for everything forever. Uh, thank you guys very much. This has been Mark Wildman. Go train.